Okay, welcome to the next class on multiple, on um, not multiple view geometry. This is variational methods, second class. And this is still the introduction and I'm finishing the introduction today. The introduction was mainly designed to motivate a little bit the topic of the class, to show you some of the recent developments in that field, to show you what kinds of things you can do with variational methods. <coughs> Um, one of the things that has become extremely popular in the field of computer vision is novel sensors. And very often once a new sensor comes out, that sparks a lot of research initiatives, people looking into what can you do with that sensor. And it often turns out you can do things that were often not possible with other sensors before. This sensor that came out a few years ago is a so-called RGBD camera. It was made popular by Microsoft. It was actually the consumer electronics that sold the fastest ever. I think they sold millions of these cameras in just a few weeks. <coughs> the technology is not entirely novel. The, the way it works, who has seen this camera before? Okay, almost everyone, yeah. So it comes with the Microsoft Xbox. In fact, in addition to the camera, there's multiple microphones and all sorts of things in there. But what is important for us is actually mostly the camera. You see there's three holes here. One is a standard color camera an RGB camera. One is a projector that projects uh, an infrared pattern onto the world. You don't see it with your eyes, but if you have an infrared camera, you can actually visualize that pattern. And the third one is a sensor that actually looks at that, uh, that acts in the infrared and sees the pattern. And based on the distortion of the pattern, it can infer depths. And so you can imagine there's a raster of infrared patterns on the world, and based on that distortion, you can estimate the depths of things. In a way that is actually fairly accurate, and as a result, you not only get color images, but you also get depth images. So a little bit like what a laser scanner gives you, depth information, the difference being that this is a, a dense two-dimensional depth map, and it comes at around 30 frames a second. So it actually has the same speed as the color camera, and so you get simultaneous depths and color images, which is more than a usual laser scanner gives you, because it doesn't scan the image point by point, line by line, but it generates a, 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 a 30 frames a second depth map. <coughs> And so one of the things you can do is you can uh, try to recover the geometry of the world around you from that camera. Here's an example of how that could work, uh, approaches that were propagated by Steinbrecher, Carroll and co-workers. The idea is that let's say you have your camera located here and at the next time instance you moved it to a new location. The issue is that what you need most critically in, in that context of reconstruction is you need to know where is my camera at any given moment. Here the way you can determine it is by a variational approach. So you want to find six parameters that model that so-called rigid body motion of the camera, translation, three translational degrees, and three rotational degrees for your camera. And these six parameters you can determine by minimizing a cost function. And if you minimize it locally, this is typically what the, gr the variational technique is about. You set up a cost function and then you try to find the parameter that minimizes that cost function. And what does this cost function look like? In this example, there are many cost functions that people proposed in the last years. Uh, and and b what they do is they basically evaluate uh, the, the, the accuracy of their method and compare to other cost functions to other algorithms. And which one is the best one is still up to debate today. And, and with every year, we get new and improved algorithms to track uh, 
the camera. Because once you have tracked the camera, what you can do is with these depth estimates, you can fuse them to get a coherent 3D map of the world, a dense surface of, of your environment. And so the camera parameters, and one thing you can imagine is critical for the accuracy of the overall reconstruction, a critical thing is to get the camera motion accurately. You know, you have one depth estimate from one location, you move the camera, get a new depth estimate. If there is an error in your camera tracking, then the scans don't align. And if you try to merge them, you will get offsets and you will get weird artifacts. And so in order to project all these depth maps into one world coordinate system, you have to know exactly where each camera was. And so it's critical to get an accurate estimate of these six parameters. In this setting, in contrast to a lot of stuff we talked about in the last uh, lecture, this is not an infinite dimensional problem, it's a six dimensional problem. In that sense, it is simpler and in fact one of the strategies you could think of in six dimensions is you could still do a complete search. You could still discretize your translation and rotation space and just try all configurations to see which one gives the best cost. You can do it, it's tedious, it takes time, but in principle it's possible. And if you implement it efficiently, there are more sophisticated so-called branch and bound techniques to more quickly prune the space of feasible configurations and they are actually more or less practical. In fact, there is one algorithm for this type of problems coming out uh, later this year where people use branch and bound techniques to efficiently find the six parameters here. <coughs> The cost function looks as follows. This is a cost function that actually uses both the depth image and the color image. The way it works is quite simply, uh, um, uh, you say that the color at any given pixel, let's call it X, should be the same color at the corresponding pixel once I move the camera because I'm looking at the same 3D point. And so I say the color, let's call this I0 is the color at that point X, the color here. II is the color at the next image, let's call it I, the image a little i. And then what do we have here? Uh, the point X is transferred into 3D. Uh, if you have a depth value U, it essentially means that you scale the point by U. That is assuming that the point is in what's called homogeneous coordinates. For those who attended my lecture last semester, oh, well, I don't have a pin on me. So the homogeneous coordinates essentially means that there is an X, a Y, and the third component that is 1. So it means that you encode this point with, with its Z coordinate being 1, the distance from the origin. So all points on the image plane have the third coordinate 1, so X is actually three component vector X, Y and 1. And once you multiply it with the depths, you have U times X, U times Y and U, and that is this point here. And since we have a Kinect camera, we have a depths estimate the function u, we have it. So we can actually pro project that point from the image plane into the 3D world. And then we can say once we rotate the world and translate with that rigid body motion g, we get the same point but in coordinates of the new camera. Mind you, we don't know the rigid body motion, but let's assume we have it. Then we can transform that. Pi is just a generic back projection, which divides by the Z coordinate to get back the 2D coordinates, and so then the color at that point. And now we can say these two colors should be the same, and that should hold for all points X in this image plane omega. Yes? Oh, wow. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, so homogene, these are called homogeneous 
genius, genius, uh, coordinates. And what it means is that every point x has x, y, 1. So this is uh, just the third component being 1. You might wonder, why would you represent 2D points with this representation? Well, as you can see in these equations, it makes the world a little simpler. Because then u times x is ux, uy, u. And that is exactly the point that we see up there in the 3D world. It has the z-coordinate u, and x and y are scaled with u as well. And so this would be a cost function, and then we have to minimize this cost function. There are many ways to do that. I will not go into detail. One uh, idea would be to do a gradient descent, to start with some initial guess of xi, and then gradient descent. Another alternative that is commonly used is to linearize this in xi. I think we'll see a little more later in class on that. And then you get a cost function that I is convex. And that can be minimized globally. In But the assumption about in the linearization is that you are already close in some sense to the right estimate. Then the assumption is that the camera motion was small. In practice, whether that is a good assumption or not depends on the application. For example, if you do real-time camera tracking and you get a new camera motion every uh, 30 times a second, then typically the motions are fairly small. Because you, and, and in fact, a lot of these approaches in computer vision make small motion assumptions to solve the problems because, see, the difficulty with this cost function is it's not convex in Xi. So if I try to solve this for the best Xi in R6 and I don't want to do a complete search, I, there's, it's very hard to actually find optimal solutions. In general, it's not possible. And so you typically make additional assumptions. If you assume Xi is small, you can do Taylor approximations and then you can get a convex uh, uh, approximation. And that can be solved, and so under the assumption that the motion is small, you get good results. And fortunately for us, the faster the cameras get, from 30 frames, say, to 60 frames, to 120 frames, the more the small motion assumption is fulfilled. Even if you move the camera with a constant motion, if you have a higher frame rate from one frame to the next, the motion is more likely to be small. And so the algorithms will tend to work better with the uh, higher speed of the camera. Here's examples of what these data look like. I think many of you have seen the Xbox. Many of you may not have seen the, the data it actually generates. So this is the color image, and this is the corresponding depth image, and you see the depth is represented as brightness values here. Dark means closer by, and bright means further away. And so you can determine the depths in that way. And from that, once you track the camera, you can try to fuse these depth maps in order to get a coherent 3D representation of the scene, and you can not only fuse the depth the information in a, in a world coordinate frame, but you can also do that with the color, and so you get a colored 3D model of the world. You see it's okay, you can recognize things, but you might not be able to recognize the person anymore. How to improve the accuracy of these 3D models is a huge effort that people are working on these days. Of course, the difficulty in this setting is that there are many factors that limit the accuracy. One factor is how accurately can I estimate the camera motion. The better the camera motion estimate, the more accurate or the more consistent is the fusion. The second challenge is um, 
that the sensor itself has limited resolution, both in the depths there is a, a, a limited resolution as in the X and Y coordinates. So the solution there would be to wait for the developer of the camera to bring out the second generation and keep your fingers crossed that that second generation actually is more accurate. Connect Xbox Kinect camera, there is a second generation coming out this fall or this winter. Whether it really has more accuracy, more uh, resolution in X, Y and in the depths, I don't know yet. There's debates on that. The texture mapping, yeah, so there are different ways to do that here. The way it's, it's done is that we store the color in the 3D volume as well, and we do an averaging of the colors uh, in the same l l line as we do an averaging of the depth values from the different cameras. But an alternative would be to first estimate the, the depths and then project the colors from the images. And for example, you could use the super resolution approach that I mentioned last time to get a very accurate coloring. And that might improve not the geometry, but at least the visual appearance of what we see. We haven't done it here because I should be honest that super resolution approach is a bit computationally intense. The super resolution texturing of the rabbit would nowadays take about 20 minutes to compute. Whereas what we're aiming for here is a system that really is real-time capable, where you scan and you interactively get a 3D model right away to look at. And so, at least for now, the super resolution approach is not applicable in a real-time scenario. But there are many alternatives and some of them might give you a better compromise in terms of accuracy and speed. And so in computer vision, we're always working in that regime of what is the optimal solution to a problem and what is the fastest solution to the problem. And depending on the requirements of your uh, customer, you will have to devise different strategies. My experience is typically it's a good idea to at least think about what the optimal solution would be. Think about how computationally intense would that optimal solution be? What are ways to make it more efficient? But it's often a better strategy to first find the optimal solution to a problem and then think about speed. If you start with speed as the primary concern, then you will never actually get to the best possible solution, typically. So here is a system that actually works in real time. For those who were at the open day on Saturday, you could actually try it yourself. We demoed it there and we scanned tons of people all day long. The way it works is there is a rotating chair or a rotating platform that you stand on. Uh, and as you can see, here is the camera and here is the 3D model emerging on the fly, so to speak. So while you rotate around, there is a 3D model of that person being generated in, in real time. And so as soon as you finish rotating, you rotate around one loop, you have a 3D model that you can turn in the computer. Here again you see the process, how it works. It essentially carves out that 3D geometry using the different depth estimates. And there is many challenges, many open issues to make it more accurate. You see the resolution is okay, you can recognize the person if you know the person, but uh, I constantly feel that it should be higher resolved and there should be ways to improve the accuracy. But as I said, there are many factors that play a role. Uh, the system actually makes the models hollow, which is useful because you can nowadays print out 3D in color and the cost of printing depends on how much material. And so what, what you can do is you can just print and, and have it printed. There are services where you send it and for 10 or 15 euro you get 3D models of various sizes.
And so one of the cru crucial features of this system is it's very fast and it's very robust. So we scanned, as I said on Saturday, we scanned hundreds of people and it works pretty much every time. The only challenge is you have to hold still while you're rotating. So it does not work on my daughter, for example. She's three years old and if I tell her to hold still, she says, yes, daddy, and then she <laughs> goes like that. And, and um, the reconstructions do not look so good. You end up with multiple noses and things like that. You can imagine a little bit <laughs> what the reconstructions look like. But if people do hold still, and typically we find it works, as I said, you know, we scan lots of people. Uh, we found even p children from the age of five or six years on, you can scan them because they understand what we mean when we say hold still. And so these are a lot of the models that we scan in, and you can see you can get fairly high resolution both in the coloring and in the geometry. So a lot of these folds that you see here, they're actually in the 3D model. Once you have it in your hands, you can verify. And so it's a system that allows to generate little toy figures of family and friends. In fact, if you, if you like this, the software can be downloaded, you can test it at home. If you have an Xbox camera, a Kinect camera, and if you have a PC with a, a more modern graphics card, you, it should run no problem. And then, I don't know, they, we haven't really figured out what you do with a system like that. <laughs> but, you know, you can put things on the shelf or whatever. One of the, uh, the same system, more or less same approach, can be used in different scenarios. And this is the last part I wanted to show you about recent developments in, in our research lab. Uh, this is next door, the kitchen. And this is where we do a lot of experiments. What you see here is a quadrocopter, a flying uh, uh, um, helicopter with four rotors. They, have in, they exist in different sizes, all the way down to so-called nanocopters of this size. Uh, and as you see on top, there is a Kinect-like camera on top. It's not the exact same camera, but pretty the same sensor. Uh, um, and this quadrocopter flies autonomously using that sensor. So it can localize it, its own location using that camera with essentially the algorithm I showed you. And then you can use that location and rotation estimate to autonomously navigate a flying system. So there is no user steering the system. It actually flies autonomously, acquires data. And this is what the data looks like if you map the data into a world coordinate system. So it's exactly the depth and color sensor data that we get from that sensor, but we remove this, the ego motion of the quadrocopter because we can estimate that motion and so we can turn and translate all the measurements back into one coherent world coordinate system and this is what you see here. And we can map the estimated camera location into that system. So here you see the predefined trajectory and the actually flown trajectory. And then at some point it lands again, and, w and, th and then you can fuse these depth maps exactly like you saw it with the person scanner, and you can scan rooms. And so once the quadrocopter lands, you have a dense colored model of your room. And if you've seen how people Nowadays, measure rooms to install things. If you ever had, you know, uh, workmen in in your room to install whatever system, they measure the size of the of the of the room. It's very tedious. You, I mean, you don't have to have a manual measurement. There are lasers nowadays that you can position to determine the distance between two walls, but they would never give you a dense 3D model. And these models are fairly accurate, and they are determined on the fly, literally. What we're working on right now is actually to extend systems like that so that they can map the entire building, ideally with the 
an autonomous quadrocopter. The challenge there would be that you have to do obstacle avoidance, etc. Uh, and one challenge that we don't know how to resolve is if the door is closed, uh, you know, the quadrocopter will not open the door. So it can fly from one room to the next, but the assumption is that the doors are open. So there are certain limitations here. So to summarize this first part, I showed you a little bit uh, about applications of variational methods, what, what is being done these days, dense reconstructions from images, coloring, texturing, 3D models, super resolution texturing as in this example, uh, reconstruction of actions over time where you reconstruct not just one geometry at one given time but from uh, a calibrated multi-view video stream you can generate actions over time towards what is nowadays often referred to as 3D television. Then I talked about, did I talk about that? I think real-time reconstruction of dense geometry from a handheld camera. Uh, I may have skipped that, I don't remember. RGBD modeling where we use variational techniques to estimate the motion of a, a so-called RGBD camera. D stands for depths, so cameras that have color and depths. And in the end I showed applications of these RGBD cameras on autonomous quadrocopters to actually reconstruct the world around us uh, from an autonomous system. Okay, that concludes the overview or introductory part. Now I'm moving to um, the first part of the class and as I said these slides will also be online. The first part is taking one step back and going more into an introduction of basics of image analysis because we're learning about variational methods for image analysis and computer vision so I want to start by making sure that everyone knows a little bit the basic ideas uh, about, about images, how to represent images, how to process images so that we have a little bit of the basics as a foundation for then the variational techniques. Some literature I will bring some books next time. I couldn't bring them today because the, the, the stack is so so large, they're on my desk, but uh, tomorrow I'll bring the books, at least some of these books. There is much literature in the field. Uh, the class, the way I design it, is not covered by one single book. This is a, a big problem in the field of computer vision. The field is developing so fast that a lot of things you will not find in one single book, but there is a collection of books that have at least some aspects of interest in them. And so these are four books on variational methods and partial differential equations. For example, the Korn-Probst Aubert book, I think it already exists in the second edition now. Uh, Mathematical Problems in Image Processing, Partial Differential Equations and the Calculus of Variations. And then Chan and Chen, Image Processing and Analysis, Variational, PDE, Wavelet, and Stochastic Methods. Uh, Morel Solimini, a slightly older but uh, also quite interesting book, Variational Methods in Image Segmentation. So this is more focused on segmentation. And this book is, uh, revolves a lot around the so-called mumford Cha Variational Model that was very influential in image segmentation. And this is a, the most recent among these books, a book by Brady St. Lawrence, that the, at least this version is in a German edition. But I was recently contacted by Springer or Teubner, I don't remember, about they, they were interested in translating that book to English. Why Brady St. Lawrence developed, uh, wrote their book in German, I don't know exactly. Uh, but I'm pretty sure there is an English version following up. If it's not out yet, it should come out someday. <coughs> 
the books are slightly different. Uh, a lot of these techniques and similarly a lot of these books are on the interface between computer science and applied mathematics. And similarly, the authors are typically on the interface. These are often math uh, authors from, from math, uh, from the field of math, but so there is a little, and there is actually more books I will bring next time that are uh, more on the mathematical side, but that are a little more advanced on specific aspects of variational methods. Okay, one of the key features in variational methods is often that they take a continuous viewpoint. So they, they make the assumption that the world we live in is a continuous world and similarly images are often treated as continuous mappings. And uh, this is a, an, uh, a point of, I should say, endless debate because, as you know, the images we get from a digital camera are discrete. And not just discrete in space, as you see here, but also discrete in color. The color values, the brightness values, they have a, a discrete spectrum. Uh, the discretization in space is often called sampling. The discretization in the color space, in the value space, is called quantization. And so you typically have both of these aspects in, in, in discrete images, the way you acquire them. Nevertheless, you will see throughout the class that there is a, an advantage in actually modeling images as continuous mappings. So there are different levels of discretization, as I said. You have discretization in color and brightness, called quantization. You have discretization in physical space, called sampling. And then you have, in addition, if you are talking about videos, for example, you have discretization in time. The images only come one step at a time. <coughs> Nevertheless, you can model videos as continuous in time as well. Of course, the measurements are discretized, but whatever you see in these images, the action behind it is in continuous time. This, as I said, is an endless debate. At some point it becomes very philosophical. And whether the world we live in is really continuous or discrete is, uh, you know, if you go deep down into quantum physics, people will tell you there is a discretization as well in the world. But uh, at least, uh, for example, for our eyes in the physical world, you can approximate it as a continuum. <coughs> When I say images, what I mean is a mappings from some subset of Rn to Rd. Rd, and, and to give you some examples, so in general images are a mapping from subsets of Rn to Rd. So this is taking the continuous viewpoint. And just to give you examples, n is typically the dimension of your input domain. And so for regular images, n would be 2. If you have volumetric images, for example, if you get some 3D scan done in hospital, then you have 3D data. And so then your input domain omega is a subset of R3. Or if you have 2D images but video, so over time, then you can model that as a mapping from some subset of R3, where the third component is your time component. And similarly, if you have volume images over time, there are nowadays ultrasound scanners that scan 3D in, in time. So it's actually quite amazing what can be done today, and that would be n equals 4 then. Um, Uh, the drawback or the difficulty in that setting is that th the data they generate is so huge that you can typically not store it. So there is quite a need in that domain for online algorithms that process the data as it comes because it's too much to store it. D is the dimension of the output space. If we talk about 
gray value or brightness images, D is typically 1. If we talk about color images, typically D is 3. Uh, once D is larger than 1, people talk about multispectral images. And recently, when it's really large, people talk about hyperspectral images. I've never met anyone who can specify at what D it becomes hyper, from multi to hyper, and you might wonder if you already have the term multi, why do you need to introduce a new term? Well, usually new terminology is a sales point. You want to sell your technology to, for example, funding agencies, and you want to tell the world, I'm doing something radically new here. And one way of doing that is to introduce new terminology. And so this is how hyperspectral comes about. <coughs> yes, so we have that continuous mapping, say for images in, in, in R2, we have coordinates x and y denoting the point in space, and once we discretize them, we get values at discrete pixels, 1, 1, 1, 2, and we get an array of values, and typically the function values are also discrete, as I said. For example, in the range from 0 to 255, or in, in more, a more detailed color quantization. So that very much depends on the image format that you have. There's tons of different formats for images and, and so depending on whether they are brightness or color and how they are resolved, etc. Some comments before I go into the continuous world about drawbacks and advantages of discrete and continuous methods. So to start with the advantages of discrete representations, because there is a large part of the community working in the discrete setting, they argue that digital images are discrete, and so when you process them, you also require ultimately a discretization. In the computer you have to process a finite number. You cannot process a continuum directly. And so once you discretize you don't need to numerically approximate things because you can represent them directly in the discrete setting. So you don't need to do a transition from a discrete measurement to a continuous world and then a discrete uh, implementation in the computer again. In addition, for discretely formalized, formalized problems, there exist for some problems efficient algorithms from discrete optimization, graph theoretic algorithms typically, that you can apply to that problem. So when you, we saw a couple of variational approaches, they often have integrals over the image plane. In the discrete setting, you would have sums instead of integrals, sums over the discrete pixels, and then you would have to minimize some cost uh, on that discrete grid. And depending on what the cost looks like, what the form of the cost function is, there are polynomial time algorithms around to solve the problems. And, and if you have a polynomial time algorithm, chances are it may be very efficient and very fast to do. Uh, in turn, the advantages of the continuous representation are firstly that the world that we see through the camera is, as I said, a continuous world. At least that is a fairly good approximation. And since ultimately computer vision doesn't want to make statements about the discrete image, but statements about the world that is seen in these images, it is often of advantage to have a continuous representation. And the mathematics of continuous worlds has a much longer tradition. It is very old partially because we didn't have computers for centuries. And so mathematicians developed theories in a continuous space. And so there's functional analysis, there's differential geometry, how to model surfaces in a continuous setting. There's partial differential equations and group theory to model motion in a continuous space, etc. 
In addition, there are some properties, for example, rotational invariants that are easier modeled in a continuous setting. If I write down a continuous formulation, there is no underlying grid, and so typically, by default, I will have rotational invariants. Whereas if I formalize something in a discrete setting, this is often more difficult. Because if you rotate a regular grid, the rotated grid is no longer regular, etc. So things are, are a little bit more tricky in the discrete setting. In some sense, the continuous models correspond to the limit of infinitely fine discretization. And with more advanced sensors, we are actually getting into that limit, you know. The digital cameras have more and more megapixels. The frame rate of video cameras gets higher and higher. And so the discretization is approximating more and more a, a continuous world. So here is an image and it's discretization. In fact, I was a little bit puzzled when I started image processing and I wanted to see the pixelization. So I downscaled the image to a level where it only has 32 by 32 pixels and then I wanted to see the pixelization. That's not actually easy to do, surprisingly. Because if you downscale it and then you want to see it looks like that, you don't really see much. Then if you take your standard viewing program and enlarge it, you don't see the pixelization either. Why? Because typical programs will interpolate. So they see immediately the resolution is too low to see it on a thousand by thousand pixels on the screen, so they interpolate the values, meaning you don't actually see the original data. Your image, uh, image display program will typically fool you and show you something else. But nevertheless, of course, you can do it. And if, if you do that, for example, by, by imposing that you don't want any interpolation, or what's called the nearest neighbor interpolation, then you get this pixelization. And there you see the discretization artifacts in that close-up. Here is quantization, so that is the discretization of, of images, not in the spatial domain, but in the brightness domain. So here you have a brightness image with 256 levels of gray, 16 levels, 4 levels, and 2 levels, meaning just black and white. And here, one should say, the two levels were chosen appropriately in the sense that much of the relevant structure is still there in the two-level setting. If you choose a bad quantization, then you don't actually see the head anymore. You might just see the nose area or something like that. Uh, why is quantization helpful? Uh, it is sometimes helpful to quantize image, to, to boil them down to a black and white world, because sometimes you want to process the data later on with some algorithm that, for example, determines the area where is the head, where is no head. And, and in this image, it's difficult for a computer to say where's the head. Here, once you've quantized that, it essentially amounts to taking a decision, which parts are still part of the head, which are not. So it's, it's a kind of a post-processing that facilitates subsequent, uh, you know, robotic tasks, for example. So, for example, in, 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 a, in an industrial application of computer vision, this kind of uh, binarization is, is important to see where are parts on, on a conveyor belt, where is the part if you want to grab it with a robot arm. You need some hard decision, where is the object, where is the boundaries of the object. And this is then called the segmentation, and as you can see, with just quantization, you get some kind of foreground-background separation. Not the best one, of course, but at least it's an algorithm that is very fast and, and works. As I said, usually when you enlarge images, you don't see this uh, discretization in space, but what you typically will see is this. So you will get a blurred version of, of the high-resolution image. <coughs> 
And what, what is being done here is called uh, an interpolation. And there are many strategies to interpolate. And this is an important problem you can imagine because uh, often images are low resolution, but the user wants to see it some in more detail. And the, the difficulty is how to interpolate it in a way that you really do get better details. There is only so much you can do, of course, if you have no information. It's hard to hallucinate that information. Uh, but uh, one strategy, a popular one, is called bilinear interpolation. The way it works is that you approximate the brightness at pixels x and at points x and y as uh, as a function uh, of x and y that is bilinear in x and y, so ax, by, cx, y plus d which essentially means that um, you have your four pixels in a neighborhood and you want to find the value in between and so what you do is you interpolate that bilinearly, fit some uh, bilinear function to it and then read out the value in, at any point in between. And so you have four coefficients here, A, B, C, D, to represent the brightness function in a certain area in, in between four pixels. And then um, you can determine these parameters simply by fitting that function to the brightness values at these four pixels. So if you have four pixels here, one, two, three, four, you have four brightness values and you can fit this function to the four values. Read out the parameters A, B, C, D, and with that you can determine the brightness value according to this fitted function in between pixels. This is the most standard interpolation. There is also bicubic interpolations where you take more parameters and need a larger environment to fit the parameters. Uh, or there is a simpler so-called nearest neighbor interpolation. The nearest neighbor interpolation essentially gives you this function. Uh, this image. What it does is it just for any pixel checks what is the nearest pix pixel in some distance and takes that value. And so if you have um, a regular grid, say here are your four pixels and you want to determine the value here, then you have colors at these four pixels. This one is the nearest one and so all the points here get one color, the points there get the color of that pixel, etc. So this is a is a, is a very simple, naive interpolation that gives you a larger image. So although we only have the values at discrete points, we can, of course, fill a continuous space by interpolation. Once you have images, you can filter images. And this is an important aspect because it leads the way to so-called a more advanced so-called diffusion filtering techniques and also to then the variational approaches. The idea of filtering is that you get some input image, you process it with some operator T and you get an output image that I call G here. Typically G uh, the, the func the, this operator T acts on a certain spatial neighborhood, so the value of the new image, the filtered image G at X and Y, will typically depend on the values of F in the vicinity of X and Y. Sometimes it only depends on the value at the same pixel x and y. This is the simplest form of operators um, and this is then called a local brightness transform. And that can be simplified by saying depending on what the brightness f is, there is some output brightness. And, and so if r is the input brightness, s is the output brightness. And then you apply that transform to every pixel. That is a very simple and naive transformation. Nevertheless, you can do a lot of interesting things with these simple brightness transformations. So I want to look into that a little bit. Um, this may not be novel to people who have already worked on image processing, but for those who haven't, it maybe gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can do with brightness functions. Uh, uh, 
In most cases, when you do brightness transforms, you uh, assume that the transformation is monotonically non-decreasing. Uh, so it's monotonous in the sense that if the brightness R1 is smaller or equal than R2, then after transformation that ordering of brightness values is preserved. So typically you don't want to impose, transform the brightnesses in a way that something that is bright gets darker than something that is uh, less bright. So you want to preserve this ordering of brightness values. If you have less than here, then the transformation is called strictly monotonous. There is a difference if, if uh, a transformation is strictly monotonous, then you can invert it. You can get back from the transformed image back to the original image. In any kind of image processing and transformations, it's useful to at least keep in mind whether the transformation you apply is invertible or not. Because invertible essentially implies that you're not losing information. It means that you can always get back from the transformed image to the original data. And so the original data can be reproduced. Any transformation that is not invertible invariably loses information. You cannot get back to the original data, so some information about the original data is lost in the transformation. And so if you want to preserve information, then invertible transformations are helpful. Here are some invertible transformations, at least this one is invertible. This is called a, a contrast stretching. Um, what it does here, you have the input brightness, dark being low values on the left and bright being high values on the right. Sim and here is the output brightness, T of R. And so as you can see what this transformation does, I said it's invertible, that's actually more or less true. Um, what it does is that all the brightness values in this part of the spectrum are stretched. Right? And so uh, a, a, a value uh, input brightness here gets mapped to a very dark value, input brightness there gets mapped to a very bright value. You would apply such a transformation if the structures you're interested in, say in a medical image, the doctor wants to see where is the bone, where is the cartilage, etc. And in that setting, you want to check what is the range of brightness values associated with the bone, and then you may want to stretch that so that you use the brightness information that is available to represent the area of brightnesses that you are most interested in. But in turn, these areas are collapsed, right? So, so all of these brightness values are essentially mapped to dark. And if it's perfectly flat, it's actually no longer invertible. Because then I have zero here as an output, and the input could have been any value in that range. So invertible means the slope should never be exactly zero. It should always be positive. The extreme case of a contrast stretching, if I stretch more and more and more, I get this mapping, and this is called a thresholding. Thresholding is a transformation that essentially binarizes the image from some gray value input to a black and white image, where all values below some value m are set to black, all values above are set to white. Like the head image I, sh I showed you earlier, that was binarized in that fashion. And so Thresholding, as I said, is a limiting case of the contrast stretching, provides a binary image, and as I mentioned earlier, this can be useful for further post-processing, because there is, in some sense, a decision taken for every pixel. Are you in that domain or in that domain? There are other important 
brightness transformations, uh, uh, so-called power law or logarithmic transformations. And here you see some of them. Uh, there is different ways to represent them. The logarithmic transformation would look like that, log of 1 plus r. Uh, and the the power law would be c of r to the power of c times r to the power of gamma and for different gamma values for the power law you get these curves here and so you can imagine what effect they have the curves down here tend to darken the image so the range bef uh, um, before was this range so very bright values here and they're all mapped to essentially dark and these transformations tend to brighten the image. In fact, uh, the inverse to the power law transformation is called the gamma correction. And the gamma corrections, they look the same, essentially. The inverse means you flip them at the, at the axis. Um, the gamma correction is frequently done in monitors. And if you've ever given a talk and shown photographs or images, you may have found this issue that on your screen you see the picture really well, right? And then you project it with the projector on, on, onto, the, onto the wall, and all of a sudden the image is completely overexposed or completely dark and you can no longer see the faces anymore. Often when people give talks you have that issue. They see, oh, here's a picture with my friend in the sunset and you don't see anything because the, the faces are too dark. And then you wonder, why is that so? Why do I see the image differently on that screen and on this screen? And the reason is that between the two screens there is some gamma correction being done. And you can actually invert that by applying the, the inverse. And so you can correct this brightness by doing a gamma. This is why it's called gamma correction. It's done very frequently for displays to make sure that the image actually is, is in, a, in a presentable brightness range. So if you ever have issues with overexposure or underexposure in your slides, you know, gamma correction is the way to fix it. And it's not surprising. You just take the values and you, you know, increase the brightness or decrease the brightness uh, as desired. Here's examples of so-called contrast enhancement. Uh, the power law transformation can be used to enhance contrast in certain domains. This is the input image, and these are different power law transformations with different values of gamma. Gamma, the smaller gamma gets, uh, the, the, the more it moves away from one. One means a uniform, a, a, an identity transform, so nothing happens. And the, the, the more different you are from one, the more the stronger the transformation. And what you see here, all of a sudden, there are structures emerging that you didn't actually see in the input image. And this may be important if, for example, in the medical domain, if the doctor is particularly interested in that structure, then the input image is not going to help him. But then the power law transformation does the trick. So with very simple brightness transformations, contrast enhancement, contrast stretching, gamma corrections, you can actually change the, the, the brightness values to bring them into a domain where the human eye can see structures better. Here is more extreme transformations, uh, uh, these two so-called gray level slicing approaches, what do they do? Anyone can tell me? Let's look at this one for example, what does this transformation do? Anyone have an idea? Yes? Yes. So it only it masks out certain gray values, but what does it do with these gray values? To some, to some constant brightness, yeah. So this is also a, a kind of a binarization, a mapping to two values of brightness. And basically you, you say, for example, if you want to highlight the structure, some 
uh, component in a medical image and you know that component has brightness values in the range from A to B, then with this transformation you can make it light up and the rest will be completely black. And so this is a very interesting processing that simplifies the task for the user and basically shows him here is the structure you're interested in. What does this do in turn? Yes? Exactly. So it also makes the structure you're interested in constant, but it cranks up its brightness. So it lights up, but the rest of the image stays the same. So these are interesting transformations. Mind you, these transformations are not invertible. So if you have exactly that gray value, it may well be that it was the same gray value in the input, but it may be that it was much darker. So obviously these are not strictly monotonous, so you cannot invert them, but sometimes you don't want to invert them. You want to light up structures and to display them to the human. Filtering, when I started image analysis, my background is actually physics, and filtering was a strange term to me. If you're doing electrical engineering, you're more familiar with filtering. For me, the only filter I knew was the coffee filter. <laughs> and, and so it took me a little bit to get used to the term, but it's used frequently in signal processing. And it comes actually, it's derived from the frequency space, where you transform an image to its frequency representation using the Fourier transform and then you can filter out certain frequencies and say I only want to preserve this frequency and put all the other frequencies to zero and so it's much like a filter that lets some frequencies through and, pa and filters out other frequencies. And so this is where the term filtering comes from um, uh, and so these are often called filters, and we'll see some filters in, in the following. Uh, one uh, notation or one terminology I want to mention is from, from uh, mathematics. You may be familiar with that term linear. Uh, transformation and operator T is called linear if it fulfills these two properties. So T applied to two images, F and G, should be T of F plus T of G for any pair of images F and G. And similarly for image F and scalar alpha, any image F and any scalar alpha, T of alpha F is alpha times T of F. And an operator is linear if and only if it fulfills these two constraints. Uh, why is that useful? It's useful because it basically tells you that it doesn't matter whether I first add two images and then transform them, or whether I first transform them and then add them. It comes out to the same. And this is often a useful thing, property to have, to know. There are various linear transformations, and among them, a very popular one is the so-called convolution in German. You see, I sometimes put the German terms for those interesting. Convolution in German called Faltung. Um, the convolution looks like that. G, the output image at X and Y, is a linear combination of input brightnesses and with some weighting function W. So the way you can see that, maybe I'll draw a picture. Um, here is your image. If you want the output brightness at that point, you do a weighted combination of the input brightnesses, typically in a certain environment. Doesn't have to be, but frequently this is, this is the case. And so if this is the point X, we'll have here the point X minus X prime. So x prime being the offset vector between the two. And, uh, and then we have a weighting depending on, on the offset, w, x, y. And this is a weighting in the discrete setting, 
this is what it would look like. You would have a summation of the pixels in typically the neighborhood, and then you have an, uh, an offset, i minus m, j minus n, and some weight uh, that depends on m and n. And depending on how you set the weights, you, the convolution will do all sorts of interesting things to an image. So these are brightness tra transformations that are not local anymore, where the brightness at any pixel depends on the brightnesses of the input image, uh, ideally in some neighborhood, but possibly in the whole image if you want. Some examples I'll show you in a second. So. Uh, but before I do that, some terminology. So this weight matrix is uh, uh, is often called a mask, uh, the convolution mask, and uh, one mask to act in a very local vicinity of three by three pixels would be this one. So that's the weighting matrix W zero zero one one minus one minus one. So where the argument is always this offset vector. Um, in the continuous setting, that uh, weight matrix, the mask, is called the convolution kernel, and this is called a convolution. It's often written as W star F is a convolution of W with F. And then F, in this case, is the input image, and W is the weight matrix, or the convolution kernel. What are useful convolution kernels? Here is the most commonly used convolution kernel, the Gaussian kernel. And you can see, uh, actually, the, the, the coordinates are not the right ones, at least in this representation. The center is typically 0, 0. So the central pixel it gets most weight, and the more you move away from the center, the less weight you get. This Gaussian convolution creates a blurring of the input image because you say the brightness at the output is a weighted sum of my neighbor brightnesses, where the weight decreases the further I go away. In practice, the Gaussian is always positive. It's never zero exactly, but once you implement it, typically you go to maybe one, two, or three sigmas, and then the rest you save. Doesn't matter, you can ignore. So, um, this is called low-pass filtering, the smoothing or low-pass filtering. These kinds of filters, the Gaussian and uh, various other filters, uh, uh, they are particular types of neighborhood filters. Because the brightness of the output depends on the brightnesses in some neighborhood, uh, input brightnesses in some neighborhood. Um, here is the Gaussian smoothing kernel. As you can see, it has some sigma, some widths that depends on how much blurring do you want to create. The larger sigma, the more averaging of a, over a larger and larger neighborhoods happens, and so the more blurring you get. In fact, if you let sigma go to infinity, you get a constant output image. There are alternative solutions, often simpler solutions, sometimes faster to implement as well. For example, so-called box filters can be implemented very efficiently, and they are much like a Gaussian filter, except that the weights are constant in that mask. And typically, you would want the averaging, or the, 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 this weighted average, to be such that the overall brightness is preserved. And you can assure that by normalizing these masks. So for example, if you have these 3x3 three three masks with lots of 1s, there is 9 1s, and so you divide 1 over 9. So you normalize the mask, and that assures that you preserve the average brightness. It means that once you filter the image, then it gets blurred, but it doesn't get brighter with every filtering. The average brightness is preserved. This is true, but uh, f inside the image, once you get to the boundary, it's, you have to adapt this weighting, because once you do a weighted sum of pixels in the vicinity, and this is the end of the image, so to speak, then you have no more brightness values there. And so then you're only averaging four pixels, namely the, in the corner, and then you should do 
1 over 4 in this case. So you have to adapt the mask uh, appropriately at the boundary. This is actually a critical issue, I should say, in a lot of image processing techniques and papers, uh, people detail their algorithm, but they often neglect what they actually do at the boundaries. These are often technical details that are not in the papers. One solution to this issue uh, that is often simple before changing the masks, what you can do is you can just expand the image a tiny little bit by copying the boundary values to one over. If you're three by three mask, it means you still have enough neighbors in that expanded image. So this is often the simplest solution. The Gaussian blurring is interesting, but it's often not what people want in practice. They want to remove noise and, and oscillations through, due to noise in the images, but they don't want to blur structures. And so one alternative is the so-called median filter. Uh, it's one particular type of an order statistics filter. And these filters are typically not linear anymore. So I showed you what linearity means, and I, sh I mentioned it's a nice feature to have. Nevertheless, in a lot of image processing, nonlinear approaches are more powerful. Because with linear techniques, you can only get so far, and there's a lot of nonlinear techniques that give you much better results. And a lot of the variational techniques we will discuss, the more interesting ones are actually nonlinear approaches. Order statistics filters are filters where the brightness uh, I showed, I mentioned it here, of the filtered image depends on the order of brightness values in a certain neighborhood. So what I do, for example, if I am at a certain pixel here, um, Let's say you have your pixel grid and you want to process, say, this pixel here. Then you look at the brightness values in a certain neighborhood and you order them, in, in, say, in increasing fashion. And then um, what you can do is you can take the central value the so-called median of these numbers, and put that as the new brightness value here. That, you can imagine, also creates a certain uh, uh, denoising. For example, if this pixel was white and all the neighbors were black, then the median would be black as well. And so the white pixel would completely disappear in the median filtering. So, you know, fine scale noise, so called salt and pepper noise, is ideally removed with the median filter. Yeah, so I showed it here. This noise is called salt and pepper. Sometimes it's called impulse noise. And this noise, if you have that kind of noise on images, then Gaussian smoothing is not good but median filtering will typically give very nice results. And so in, in, in general, the median filter will induce less blurring, so it will all the, also smooth the image, denoise the image, but it will not blur the image as much. Here's an example. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. This is the noisy input image. This is the Gaussian smooth image. It looks almost the same. It, it is a little bit, but as I said, the reason why it looks the same is that I think the human, that the human eye does a certain kind of denoising. So if you look at the numbers, they're, they're definitely not the same, but to the human eye, there is very little difference here. And, and still you see that edges are getting blurred here. Here the, there is a sharp edge and it's getting slightly more blurry in the Gaussian filtered image. And then if you want to remove more of the noise, you have to increase sigma in the Gauss filter and that blurs structures even more. And this was a huge issue in the 70s and to some extent 80s in the image processing community that you want to have denoising, but you want to preserve structure. 
As I mentioned last time, there is a, an endless debate what is structure and what is noise. If we have both superposed, we don't know beforehand. But typically noise happens on a high frequency domain, on a high, uh, because it's typically independent from one point to the next. And so you want to have some smoothing, but you want to preserve edges. And as you can see, the median filter does quite a good job on that. And this shows you one example of where nonlinear methods are often more general and more powerful than linear ones. The next thing are derivative filters. So these are filters that do not create smoothing, but they uh, try to find, for example, discontinuities in images, edges, and, and highlight edges. Uh, and the edge, the idea being that an edge is a transition from a dark, if I have space here, and uh, I have an edge, it goes from dark to bright. And so this location where I have the transition from foreground to background, from, uh, from dark to bright, is a transition, uh, is where the, the derivative is very high. Here is again the, defi uh, the definition of derivative. Uh, you should be familiar with that. In images, of course, we have two coordinates, and so invariably we will have partial derivatives. So df by dx is defined as f of x plus epsilon and y minus f of x and y divided by epsilon, and then you let epsilon go to zero. In a discrete world, you cannot let epsilon go to zero because you don't have continuous values. But you can easily approximate these derivatives. Uh, what I show here is some notations that I will use throughout class to denote derivatives. This is the common one, df by dx. Sometimes I'll just write it as dxf with the round d denoting the partial derivative, or sometimes I will just write fx. And this is one possibility of how to discreetly approximate this derivative at any point x and y. At any pixel, for example, x and y, you take the pixel to the right, you take the pixel to the left, the difference between these brightness values, you divide by the distance you walked to if you are exact, you should say two times the width of a pixel, because that is the, the step size epsilon that we took. Uh, and so this is a discrete approximation of this. Once you have this discrete approximation, the next thing you might ask is, why do we do it this way? Why not differently? Indeed, you can do it differently. And uh, the short message is, there is not one solution that works best for every application. And so in practice, this is called a symmetric difference because you do it symmetrically, uh, forward, backward. And this is called a forward difference where you just take the pixel on the right and subtract the central pixel. And similarly, this is called a backward difference. And so you, in, in discretizing variational methods and partial differential equations, people use all sorts of discretizations. They use symmetric differences in some settings, forward and backward differences. And I think I'll show you a little bit in the coming lectures what the advantages and drawbacks are of, of these discretizations. But ultimately, the full picture only emerges, you know, it's, it's an endless story, one could say. There's, you know, you could take five or six classes on numerics of, of different differential equations, and, and then you can get into all the details of, of different kinds of discretizations. So it's a very long story, and at some point it even becomes somewhat of an art to find the best discretization for a given problem. In practice, though, if you take any discretization, you will typically get good solutions.
and often the discretization is not critical. There are some phenomena in, in the sciences where having a good discretization is, of cru is crucially important to get meaningful simulation results. For example, um, uh, if you want to simulate the evolution of shock waves, uh, then having the right discretization is crucial, so there are certain physical phenomena where it's important to discretize properly. So here is an example of brightness functions and what they look like in the computer. Uh, this is an input image. It's almost black and white, you would say, at least for the human eye, as I said, it is. This is white, this is black. But if you look into the brightness values, if you take this ray here and, 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 and basically show the brightness values along this line, then you see they're not really constant. They're really fluctuating a lot. And some of the dark values in this area are almost as, dar as dark as some of the bright values in that area. And so if you add a little bit of noise, that gets substantially worse very quickly. Here are some examples of noise. This is a pure black and white image. If I take the X derivative, I can actually localize the, the, the transition from white to black. And so people thought, well, we can use derivatives to localize objects and determine their boundaries. And this is how image processing was done in the 70s. You would try to identify parts on a conveyor belt by computing the derivative and checking where is it maximal. And then you would say that uh, you would mark the points of maximum derivative and that would be the boundary of your object. And once you actually ran it in real world conditions, you found it didn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is you can see it here. If you add some noise, you can as a human still nicely see this transition from black to white. If you then draw the points of, of uh, it co compute the X derivative, this is what it looks like. So you can still see a darker line, but if you then want to localize, mar mark those points with strong X derivative, you will get tons of points everywhere you will not no longer get the boundary of, of your object. And so what we find, and this was a finding that people realized in the 70s and 80s, is that derivatives are very sensitive to noise. So if you have a certain amount of noise, this is the derivative along the x-axis and uh, uh, for, for a certain uh, y-coordinate. And then if I ask you where is that derivative maximal, and that is the transition, it's everywhere, you know. It's, it looks like an almost random function. But in principle, what we see in that way is that vertical edges, like we saw them, brightness edges, can in principle be determined as maxima of the x derivative. And similarly, of course, I can localize uh, horizontal lines as the maxima of the y derivative. With that simple approach, we can only lo uh, determine horizontal and vertical edges, but there is ways to generalize that to arbitrary edges. But what we see is that there is a sensitivity to noise. Maybe I'll ask around to see how creative you are. How do you think we could resolve that noise sensitivity? How could we use derivatives to determine edges in a way that is more robust to noise? What could you do, maybe pre-process the image in some way to reduce the noise, any blur, exactly. We can blur it, and as we saw earlier, maybe even apply a median filter to blur it in a way that the edges are preserved, and then compute the derivative on the blurred image. And in fact, anyone who does image processing knows that and uses that. So if in any paper you see we compute the derivative of the image, typically what the author means is of the blurred image. Because derivatives of the input image are so noise sensitive that you may not want to do that.
So typically, whenever a paper computes the derivative of the input image, you have to be careful. Uh, either uh, typically what it means is you have to uh, first blur it, maybe Gaussian smooth a little bit, and then apply the derivative. Once you have edges in arbitrary direction that you want to capture with derivatives, you can compute the gradient. The gradient, for those who haven't seen it, is that triangle with it pointing down. Mind you, this is very important, uh, and it, so I put it on the board. For, for some people it's obvious, but for, if you're not from a more mathematical background, this is called, uh, this is the derivative operator. It stands for derivative in x and in y direction. This here, the triangle down, is called the Laplace operator. And it's the x derivative squared plus the y derivative squared in two dimensions. So these are two very different symbols and you should not confuse them. If you apply this operator, it's called NABLA actually. In the literature this is called the NABLA operator. I don't know where the term comes from actually. And this is called the Laplace operator. The NABLA operator is the derivative operator, so a derivative in x and a derivative in y direction. If you apply it to a scalar function f, then it's called the gradient of f, and so it's a vector containing the x and the y derivative of your function f. You can then determine the norm, the Euclidean norm of that vector. This is this expression here. So the x derivative squared, so the partial derivative squared, sum of partial derivative squared, and the square root. This is the gradient norm. Sometimes in the literature, this here itself is called the gradient. So there is a little bit of a, a, a um, ambiguous terminology. If you read gradient, strictly speaking, it should be the vector of the of partial derivatives. But sometimes what the authors mean is the norm of that vector. And they just call it the gradient as well. So, for example, when you say an edge is a location of strong image gradient, of course you mean the norm of the, you know, for a vector to be strong doesn't really have a meaning. So, so these terms are used exchangeably. <coughs> the gradient norm is a very useful operator, but you should keep in mind it's a nonlinear operator, which means if you take two images and sum them, and then compute the gradient norm, or first compute the gradient norms of the two images and sum them afterwards, of course you don't get the same thing. But it is an operator that allows to detect edges in arbitrary orientation. The reason being that if you have an edge in an arbitrary orientation, then the brightness changes both in x and in y direction, sometimes a little more in x direction if it's a more vertical x, sometimes more in y direction if it's more horizontal edge, but you basically measure the changes in x and in y direction. And you sum these changes in, in this manner, and so it measures changes in any direction. The gradient norm, you can check it for yourself, is what's called rotationally covariant. That means that if I first rotate an image and then compute the gradient, or if I first compute the gradient and then rotate, comes out to the same. In the literature, this is often called rotationally invariant. Strictly speaking, that is not correct. Invariant means that uh, if I apply it, the structure doesn't change at all. Rotationally invariant means if I rotate the image and then apply the gradient, I get the same as if I just apply the gradient. But, but of course, that's not true. I mean, of course, you get the rotated gradients. And so, um, yeah. So this is called rotationally covariant. You can actually write it down if you want. You can say, um, 
I think that's getting a little bit too far, but but so this is called rotationally covariant. It means you it's exchangeable. You can either apply the gradient, then rotate, or first rotate and then apply the gradient. And this is very useful because it means the gradient operator or this gradient norm is an operator, sorry, that can be used that can be used uh, and is independent of how I hold my camera. I will get the same performance even if I rotate the camera. So this covariance is, is vital for image analysis. Here's an example of the image gradient. So this is the input image and these are the uh, is a, a visualization of the gradient where black means the gradient is zero and white means the gradient is large. And so you can see at the boundaries of objects you typically get large values of the gradient. But what you also see, if even, you know, coins are essentially uniformly colored, and this might be an application that would be useful in, you know, if, let's say you are at the cashier's desk, and you throw a lot of coins on the table, and you want a computer to figure out quickly how much money is on the table. You know, if you, that it would be terribly useful, for example, if you're standing in line uh, at, at Aldi or so, and then, and then you have an older lady in front of you and she can't count the money and then she throws it all on there. Takes forever sometimes, right? And you wish there was some algorithm that did it quickly and said how much money was there. Uh, but it turns out it's not, you know, you could use these gradient filters to determine the boundaries of coins and then from then on you can determine the size of the coins and using the color information you could determine which coin am I looking at, etc. But you already see here, although the coin is uniform material, since it's metallic it reflects the light and so you get strong brightness value transitions also in this domain. And as a consequence, it's uh, much harder to localize coins just using gradient. Although this image has no noise in it, right? And in real world conditions, if your background is not really white either, it may get more and more difficult. But at least you can see you can do some things with this operator. Here's the flipped version of the Nabla operator, the Laplace operator. Here it is. Um, the Laplace operator is sometimes written as Nabla squared. What it basically means is if you take uh, um, the derivative operator and square it, it means dx dy transpose times dx dy, you get dx squared plus dy squared, and that is indeed the Nabla the Laplace operator. So it's an operator of second derivatives. Nabla applied, by the way, to a vector is called a divergence. So the Nabla, this is why I wrote Nabla here, sometimes this is called gradient if you apply it to a scalar. And sometimes it's called divergence if you apply it to a vector. And I know researchers who don't like the symbol nabla for that reason. And so in their papers they will either write gradient as grad, often short grad for gradient, and div for divergence. And they do that to really tell the reader what they mean, which structure they're applying this operator to, whether it is a scalar or a vector they apply it to. And so this is the, the Laplace operator, is just the sum of second derivatives in each component. So the derivative in x squared, uh, the uh, second derivative in x plus the second derivative in y. By the way, the same operators of course apply to 3D as well. And then you would have plus the second derivative in z-coordinate, or if you want, you can even do it in time, if that makes sense. The Laplace operator, in contrast to the gradient norm, is a linear operator. 
which means here I wrote it again that if I apply Laplace to alpha f alpha 1 f plus alpha 2 times g then I get alpha 1 Laplace of f plus alpha 2 Laplace of g for any alpha 1 alpha 2 for any f and g so that is linear uh, and as I said linearity has some advantages because I can first sum images and then apply the operator or first apply the operator and then sum the result comes out to the same. Here's what the Laplace operator does. Maybe a little intuition behind it why the Laplace does what it does. As you see the assumption here is always that uh, the brightness jumps from black to white say background foreground so we live in a simplified black and white world um, I'm already over time am I not yes you should remind me of that let's stop here and continue tomorrow